Well, welcome this morning. Uh, to this morning's uh, webinar will be based for agronomists and growers uh, on the call. Uh, today's webinar is sort of an update of spring activity of what we know things have turned out. Uh, we know how things turned out in the autumn um, and, and how some regions and districts were worse affected by uh, the, the mouse plague than others. So this morning we'll have an update from our field team, the field service managers um, who have agronomists active in their region. They will uh, give an update. Uh, I'll go to them one to one, one by one and just give a brief update of what they're seeing or what they've heard is happening in the paddocks. Uh, we've also joined by Steve Henry from CSIRO, um, probably the, the expert in mouse activity and, and tracking uh, mice activity and, and following what they're doing. So uh, Steve will give us a bit of a presentation of um, what to expect uh, from uh, or what we, we potentially will expect to see in, in the spring. And we're also joined with, uh, by David Jobling from our procurement team, uh, and he'll be able to give us an update from, from supply as he's talking to manufacturers uh, of supply and give us an update of where we are with, with actually lead times into, into baits and bits and pieces from there. Um, you will see there's a chat function. So please, if you've got any questions as we go along, if you can put them in the chat function, um, we'll, uh, we'll get some team members to read them out as we go. There will be an opportunity um, after Steve's uh, doing his presentation, he's probably going to talk for 20 or 30 minutes and present about things. And then we'll go through a bit of a session running through the questions, making sure that uh, we, we answer a lot of the questions that you're fielding through the chat function from there. Um, so uh, with, without further ado, I'll, I'll move on to the, the field service team and, and I'll start with uh, our northern, with Mick Harris up north. If you can just give the, the uh, everybody a bit of an update of what, what activity and what you're seeing in your region. Thanks, Alex. Uh, good morning, all. So Mick Harris here, um, Field Service Manager for the Northern region of the Ag and Vet footprint. Um, I'm based here in Narromine and, and my zone sort of extends west as far as Ningen and um, north to Canamble, east as far as Wellington and Cumnock and the Bogan Rivers, the southern boundary of our zone. So it's actually reasonably quiet on the mouse front as a whole for the region, but saying that, um, reports out of Canamble from our agronomist Rod Pittman up there is um, there's a little spike in activity to the northwest of, of Canamble. So the very extremity of our zone, we're seeing a little, little spike um, mainly in canola crops at the moment. So early, early sown canola crops that are setting grain, the pods are starting to get chewed. So um, it's been no real change in the last sort of week to 10 days. A bit of rain about sort of may have plateaued them a bit. Um, and then further west out to Ningen, another extremity, James O'Connor out there seeing some isolated pockets in cereals. So nothing in canola there, but cereals, some really early sown cereals. So full head emergence starting to get the node chewed. But the central part of this zone, Narromine, Warren, Gilgandra, Dubbo, there's very little to no activity in paddocks. So um, yeah, on the extremities, we're, we're hyper aware of it, obviously, but where it's going to go, hopefully Steve will be able to shed a bit of light for us today. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mick. Um, Phil Gray uh, in the Central West, can can you add any comment to anything you're seeing in your region? Yes, morning all. Uh, so the area that I'm sort of talking about today is uh, anywhere sort of south of Trundle, Condobland, down to West Wylong and into Yagara. Um, Similar to Mick, not a lot of activity yet. Uh, there's a little bit with Alice Burley down at West Wylong. Uh, a lot of the crop stages uh, sort of uh, flag minus one, two with the earlier stuff with the flag out and getting some uh, some node, node damage chewing by the mice. So they're just starting to, to hamper in. Uh, we saw at sowing time that the, the mice obviously came from the north down. So it's a little concerning that Canamble and, and Ningen are getting a bit of activity because uh, as shown last last year or early this year, they uh, they came in. The other thing is we can see mice around sheds and things like that. So they haven't disappeared like they did in 2011. So uh, it's just a, a touch that they're still about, but no no massive signs of damage damage yet. So fingers crossed they don't, but yeah, signs are saying that they uh, there is, is a little bit of activity. Thanks, Phil. Um, Tim Stivens uh, from Juni Tamora area. Can you give us a, an update with anything happening through there? 
Yeah, morning all. Tim Stivens in Juni. Um, so yeah, we we sort of mesh up to the southern area of um, of Phil. So running from sort of Grenfell down to Mangapla. Um, and as Phil mentioned, probably more activity in the northern area. Um, Bill Webb up around Grenfell uh, is still seeing some isolate activity uh, in some paddocks. Just starting to see a few mice chewings on some canola. Um, we move down to Juni. We're not seeing a lot of activity in in cropping paddocks at the moment, but we're still seeing some active holes in pasture paddocks. There's there's still remnants of um, clover burr um, piles outside of holes. Uh, and you can see tracks where mice are running in and out. We're not seeing a lot of mice physically, but they're they're obviously still there. Um, we're noticing uh, fence lines where we've had remnants of rye grass and things like that. There's still there's still activity going along fence lines and sides of roads. Uh, moving down to Mangapla, they probably had the least activity over sowing, and we're probably it's probably following that now. We're still seeing a bit of activity around silos where guys are feeding grain out and things like that, where there's a bit of a feed source. Um, one one uh, point to note um, from the guys have had some some wet areas around Tamora and up through to Grenfell that paddocks that have gone underwater or been sitting at 100% field capacity, the holes are still active in some of those once the water have subsided. So even if you've had paddocks go underwater, it's not necessarily meaning that they're all gone. So that's probably one thing to, um, yeah, don't don't count on that you've controlled them with, with a bit of water. And as Phil said, compared to 2011, when we had the last play, we had massive numbers at sowing time and they'd pretty well crashed out before spring. But it seems like we've still got remnant mice around, which, um, yeah, on the back of a big year coming up, potentially going to get going again. Thanks, thanks, Tim. Uh, Andrew Barber uh, from Wagga and, and your region, uh, have you got any update from from there, please? You're, you're on mute, Barbs. Yeah, sorry. Andrew Barber from uh, Wagga, based in Wagga, uh, stretch out to towards Griffith, up to Borellan and um, sort of down towards Henty and across to to Borey Creek area, so sort of west of Wagga. Um, similar to what Tim's saying on our eastern boundaries, um, we we've seen some uh, around food sources, certainly on um, around grain sheds and uh, silos, and uh, particularly grain bags where. There's uh, certainly a base level there. Um, we're seeing uh, some along fences, fence lines where there's still active holes. Um, and yeah, it's uh, certainly something which we can see some um, numbers ramp up very quickly as, as you'll probably find out if the, if the conditions prevail. Um, we haven't seen any damage to this point on any cereals or any canola. Uh, we're certainly keeping a close eye out and um, yeah, it's something that we, we're certainly very vigilant of and um, yeah, we're going to try and keep the growers to to also be vigilant because it um, can, can ramp up very quickly. But that's about where we're at. Right. Thanks, Barbs. Um, Andrew Bell, uh, can you give a bit of a, an idea of a position from the, the Victorian agros that you've been speaking to uh, across your, your footprint? Uh, yes, yeah, so in Northern Victoria, along the Murray um, from Cora across to Cobram and Chuka. Uh, generally, we had low to medium pressure in Victoria, start of the year, which we baited a lot of canola um, crops and early, some early cereals um, with good success. We had much lower pressure than our New South Wales counterparts. That certainly was the odd um, hot spots where corn was being grown um, and harvested we certainly saw a feed source for them and they were baiting corn crops two or three times. So there is hot spots in the region in Northern Victoria generally. Um, and so we're just concerned about going forward there, but no mice activity generally as yet, just around, as the other guys have mentioned, around sheep feeders, around silos, and um, all the agronomists are certainly out in the field and look at, talking to growers and um, looking for any signs of mice activity at the moment, but certainly not at the moment. But we we'll certainly keep aware that may change as it warms up. Um, I'm interested today to see about temperature and how things warm up with mice and their activity, see how uh, if that um, inspires them to get going again. So um, we'll be interested about that, Steve. Um, and slipping over the river into uh, Murray, over the Murray into southern New South Wales, hotspots generally right across the river, Drilderie, Corridale, 
Moama, Thara, all through that region as well. Um, but certainly low mice activity at the moment. So just um, just waiting to see um, what's going to happen in the next four weeks. Yeah, no, thanks, uh, thanks, Belly, and and thanks, guys, for that bit of a bit of a roundup through the footprint of, of where we're at. Um, I think at this moment I'll um, I'll hand over to uh, uh, Steve Henry, who's going to give us an update of um, what they're seeing or, or what what you've been monitoring, and, and probably what we can expect coming off the back of uh, what the autumn was like uh, to what we can expect uh, not only in our winter cereals, but probably into some of these you know some of these areas where we're going to be summer cropping and and, and got two you know dual cropping ahead of uh, um, you know into that summer cropping uh, corn rice etc. So, Steve, I, I can hand over to you. Thanks, Alex. I, I feel like I almost don't need to say anything now because you guys have done a great roundup and uh, you've hit on a whole lot of the really important points as you've been going through your roundup. Uh, but I'll just um, I'll endeavour to share my screen and uh, let's see how we go. Um, just bear with me for a moment. Um, and so far, so good. Get that there. Okay. Um, Oh, so I'm hoping everyone can see that. Um, I'm running on a GRDC background because um, GRDC provide all of the inf investment to do our research. Um, and for that, we are, are incredibly grateful. Um, yeah, going around the grounds like you've done just now has been really insightful for me. Uh, you've all reaffirmed um, basically what we were hearing from a whole range of different sources. So it's nice to, to hear that the, the messages are the same, but it leads us to have um, quite a degree of concern because reports of mice at this time of the year are relatively unusual. Um, and as a few of the guys said, we haven't seen that classic crash that you'd normally see at the end of an outbreak. And so that's what's leading us to say, well, right, we need to be really vigilant. The other um, almost prophetic uh, information that came out of the 2011 outbreak from around um, Horsham in Western Victoria was that they thought that the mice had gone away through the winter. They thought that they'd completely disappeared and they were back with a vengeance in the spring and they really got smashed in the spring. So, you know, I think any any form of complacency now would be would be ill advised. Um, I'm just going to make sure that I'm running beauty. Okay, so I'm going to run through the current situation, and and you guys have provided it basically, uh, but I'll I'll add a little bit more detail to that. I'll talk through some mouse facts because it's good to know your enemy, um, and hopefully that will give you a bit of an indication of you know why it's important to be looking when there's low numbers because the rate of increase is just so dramatic that you go from, oh geez, I don't think I've got much of a problem to I've got a monumental problem in, in between three and six weeks. Um, talk about the critical considerations for spring, but on top of that, we'll talk about um, the preparing for sowing summer crops, but also the, the steps that you take now associated with harvesting clean and managing stubbles through the summer might help to minimise the potential impact that we might have next autumn when we're sowing the, the next winter crop. Um, we'll talk a little bit about when is it best to bait and why. And I'll talk a little bit about our latest research relating to baits because I think that that's really important for you guys as well. Um, okay, so <laughs> in the past I've read right through this, this slide. But what, one of the things that's really interesting for me is that we've got um, a significant outbreak now in Western Australia. Um, and that's something that's a little bit unusual. And I can't recall too many times when we've had reports of mice from right through the entire cropping zone. So at the moment, we're getting the kind of reports that you guys are talking about from central Queensland all the way through New South Wales into Victoria. There, there are guys in northwestern Victoria that are baiting at the moment. Um, not hearing too much out of South Australia, but I think it's because they're so used to having mice that they're just dealing with them as they come up. Um, but then across into Western Australia as well. Um, so that's leading us to be concerned about what might be happening over the next little while. Um, the facts that we're getting reports from the northern part of the zone earlier 
uh, doesn't surprise me very much. It's probably warming up a bit earlier up there. The spring's a little bit earlier um, and there's potentially a little bit more food in the system that's leading mice to become more prominent. So they're getting active earlier. Similarly, over in Geraldton, you know, where for the last three weeks, we've been hearing about mice hitting early maturing canola um, over there because their spring is that bit earlier. And so it's not so much the fact that it's, well, it's, it's a combination of day length increasing, it warming up and more food being available in the system that leads to mouse numbers starting to increase and they become more prominent. Um, knowing what you're dealing with is really important when you're trying to control a pest animal. The mouse that you guys have in your paddocks is the same as the mouse that's here in Canberra, in Sydney, basically everywhere in the world where humans are, they're a mus musculus domestic, the, the common house mouse. Uh, there's even, I know this is anecdotal, but I've heard that, that mice managed to stow away in cargo that went to Casey Base in Antarctica, and now they're in the base there, not outside, but basically everywhere that humans are, there are mice. They start breeding when they're six weeks old, um, and they can have a litter of, of six to 10 pups every 19 to 21 days. So basically every 21 days, they're putting six to 10 pups on the ground. But the real kicker is with a lot of animals, they don't fall pregnant again until they've reared that litter. With mice, as soon as they've put that litter on the ground, within two or three days, they fall pregnant again. So there's no break in pup production. It's literally every 19 to 21 days, a litter goes on the ground. So they start breeding in the spring and continue to breed through the autumn and into the summer if conditions are favorable. And so what happened in Northern New South Wales was that you got a really good spring. They started breeding early. Conditions were favorable because you had a great crop. It was a mild, moist summer. So they kept breeding through the summer and then they were there in the autumn to smash us as they sowed the crop. So the next line is mice need food and shelter, which is der factor. But in terms of them surviving without moisture, mice can generally get all of the moisture they need out of the food they eat. So after a run of dry years, mice are still present in paddocks at really low numbers. And when you add that moisture and food, that gives them the conditions that they need to thrive. So we want to get away from this idea of mice moving through the landscape. But in fact, they're there all the time. They're just in lower numbers than that are essentially detectable. But when conditions get favorable, they breed up. And of course, we know from the, those breeding stats that the rate of increase is really dramatic. And there's a, a, a number, you know, a single pair of mice can give rise to 500 other mice in a season. I've tried to calculate that. I don't know how they do it, but, but yeah, the, the key message is you don't need to worry about the numbers. You go from really low numbers to really high numbers very quickly. Some stuff around predators, you know, I hear lots of stuff about predators controlling mice and if only we had more owls, if only we had more uh, raptors, um, foxes, cats, snakes. Um, unfortunately, the rate of increase of those species is not fast enough to deal with the rate of increase of mice. So yes, they do do better when there are mice around and you will see more raptors. You might see a few more snakes. Um, that's simply because conditions are good for them, but they're, they're, yeah, they've got no hope of controlling a mouse outbreak. And the other question I always get in these presentations is, you know, can't we just find a Khaleesi virus for mice? And again, unfortunately, there's no clear um, Achilles heel virus for, for mice like there is for humans in terms of COVID. So, um, you, know, you get these diseases that run through populations and they probably play a role in, at the end of an outbreak when mouse numbers crash away, when you get that classic crash. Um, but certainly there's not one virus that, that alone, like Khaleesi or Myxoma, that will lead to a crash in mouse populations the way we see rabbit populations get controlled by viruses. Um, interestingly, you know, in terms of describing the end of the crash, uh, end of a mouse plague, 
It's not something that's particularly well understood because it happens so fast. And it's probably a combination of mouse numbers just being so incredibly high um, that the mice actually become stressed because there's actually so many mice in the population. They're starting to run out of food. As they become stressed and run out of food, the, um, they start to turn on each other. Disease starts to move through the population because they're, they're running out of food and they're stressed. They turn on each other. They start eating the sick and weak ones. They always eat babies. And so all of those things together lead the population to just crash away and disappear. Um, if we kick on to, to things to consider, um, I think, again, it's really important to get out and monitor. And it's really important, and I still haven't been run out of town for saying this, but it's really important to get out of you, you get off your ass and go for a walk in your paddock. Because that's the way you see the signs of damage. Um, the guys are already saying that they know what to look for in the way that they've described what they're seeing already. So look for things like damage at the nodes of cereals, chewing flowers, chewing pods in, in canola and, and, and legumes. Um, don't assume that all of your paddocks are the same. So if you walk into a paddock that doesn't have any damage, go into the next one, keep looking through. Paddock history has a huge influence on the presence of mice, particularly if you're sowing canola or, or legumes into barley stubbles. Barley, as you guys know, have some uh, a tendency to lose heads prior to harvest. That provides a whole lot of food to sustain mice through the stubble phase of the crop and for them to be there present, A, when you sow the crop, but B, persist into the winter. Um, uh, an interesting, well, uh, a pretty upsetting anecdote from Queensland is just yesterday I heard that basically most of the, <clears throat> the barley crop on the Darling Downs fell over yesterday. Um, they had 10 mils of rain and, um, and a 70 kilometre an hour wind and apparently everything other than compass is lodged. So um, that will lead to a, a huge amount of food being available for mice in subsequent paddocks, in, in subsequent seasons. And uh, essentially it ensures a problem in, in the near future. Um, so have a look through all of your paddocks. I think the reason why we're concerned now is that numbers now establish the breeding potential of the population. We've gone into winter with really high numbers there'll be a higher than normal level of overwinter survival. And so if mice start to breed from a higher population base now, then the rate of increase will be much greater than if we start from a low population base. So what we're saying is if, you, if you're seeing signs of damage now, or if you're seeing signs of mice in the paddocks, maybe start to bait to push that population down at the start of breeding so that they're starting from a much lower base when they start breeding and then the rate of increase will be lower. There's also the advantage that there'll be less other food in the system. So before crops start to fill grain or start to fill heads, pods start to fill, put the bait on the ground because that gives mice the best chance of discovering that bait when there's no other food around. If you think about it from a mouse's perspective, they want to get the food that they need to survive with the least possible risk of being eaten by someone else. And so they're going to take food off the ground before they climb stems to chew pods or to chew into nodes or to, to chew heads. So if we can get that food, the bait on the ground before there's other food around in the system, that gives us a really good chance to take the breeding potential out of the population. I wouldn't be baiting if I wasn't seeing any signs of damage, but if I'm seeing signs of damage, it's not long before there's a lot of mice in the system. So let's get the bait on, the, or at least be prepared to bait early. Uh, if we're thinking about the things to consider um, in terms of summer crops, Again, all of those rules of thumb apply. You need to know what's, what's happening in the paddocks before you sow those summer crops. Um, so again, going for a walk, looking for the signs of mice. 
um, in, in stubbles when, when I'm looking for the signs of mice, I'm looking for active burrows um, and I'm walking 100 metre long transects to count active burrows in a one metre wide strip over 100 metres. That gives me a count of active burrows per 100 square metres. And then you can just multiply that up to a, a value per, of active burrows per hectare. Now I do that, I work, walk for 100 metre transects and it's really important not to add a, an extra burrow in that's sitting just outside the transect. Because if you add one burrow into that 100 square metres, you're effectively adding 100 burrows per hectare. So it's very important to be strict with yourself about what's you know, the width of your, your transect. Um, but if you've got only one burrow per 100 square metres, you've got 100 active burrows per hectare. If you make an assumption that there's two mice per active burrow and one of those is a female, then you've got 100 female mice per hectare. If in three weeks time, all of those have had six to 10 babies, you've got 800 mice per hectare. Three weeks after that, you've got another 800 mice per hectare and the first lot of babies are starting to breed. You can see that it's a really short time between, oh geez, I don't reckon I've got very many mice to I've got a monumental problem really fast. Uh, so it's really important to be on top of those things. The other thing when you're sowing summer crops is you're, you're putting food into the system that's going to sustain mice through the summer, but be cognizant of the impact that might come from, um, from crops that are adjacent to your summer crops. So I've got a, a, a very nice um, uh, slide that will photo that was provided to me by Vicky Green up at Toowoomba, uh, where they're basically almost strip cropping up there. They've got winter crop, summer crop, winter crop, summer crop. Um, it was a maize crop that was sown adjacent to a winter crop stubble. And the first six to eight rows of the maize crop had been completely decimated by mice at the point that the crop was sown uh, because they hadn't dealt with the mice in the adjoining uh, stubble paddock. So there's, there's stuff to be um, really cognizant of. And again, when should I bait it and why? Or, uh, when and why should I bait? Bait as, as early as possible when you're seeing those signs of damage because the problem goes from low to high really fast, but also bait in a scenario where you've had a chance to reduce the amount of food that's in the stubble so that you've got, mice have got the best chance of finding that bait. Um, I haven't talked about chew cards yet. This time of the year is a really good time to use chew cards. <clears throat> Again, because there's not much. Sorry. <clears throat> Again, because there's not much other food in the system. <clears throat> and so mice are able to find the chew cards. They'll eat, they're more likely to eat cards and give you an indication of what's going on. <clears throat> the cards aren't very sensitive. So Really, you're, you're measuring no mice, some mice, or lots of mice, and that's as, as accurate as your measure can be with the cards. But if you have, if I had moderate levels of activity on my two cards, I'd be concerned, and I'd be looking to take action at that point. Um, so why is food really important? Uh, mice eat three grams of food per day. Uh, there's 22 grains in a gram. Uh, therefore, a mouse needs 66 grains per day. It's about, I think it's about one head of wheat or thereabouts. Um, you can see that when, as your crops ripen, you're putting huge amounts of food into the system. Um, there's you know, 22,000 grains in a kilogram. So if you're putting all of that food into the system and then you're putting bait out at one kilogram per hectare, you're not putting very much bait into a system where there's huge amounts of food. Now, we think what happened in the summer it, it, up in northern New South Wales was before farmers realised they had a problem, mice had done so much damage to the sorghum crop that there was so much sorghum on the ground that the bait just became ineffective in amongst all of that other food. 
<coughs> excuse me. Uh, I've had a COVID test recently. I don't. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> um, so if we go back to to bait and and the reason why other foods so important, if you remember that there's um, there's in some cases we get a ton to the hectare lying on the ground and and in other presentations I bang on a lot about what comes out the back of the header because that puts a lot of food into the system to sustain mice. Um, in the Wimmera, over the last couple of years, they've had wind events prior to harvest that put about a ton of barley on the ground uh, prior to the headers going through. So if you've got a ton of, of, of grain on the ground, that equates to 2,200 grains per square metre. When we put zinc phosphide out at a kilogram per hectare, we're putting out about three grains per square metre. And so you can see from those diagrams at the bottom of that slide, if you're putting three grains per square metre into 2,200 other grains, that's a lot of competition for the attention of the mouse. And if they've been su successfully eating barley, that's all over the ground, why would they transition to bait at, at that rate? The other issue is if they if not all of the grains of bait are a lethal dose, they find the first bait, eat that, but then by the time they've found the second grain of zinc phosphide, it's probably taken long enough for that first grain to start to make them feel crook and they're not going to touch it again. And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Um, so the things to remember about crop management practice is that you know, conservation tillage results in favorable conditions for mice. In the past, when we were using conventional tillage, cultivating to control weeds, creating a seed bed, lots and lots of disturbance, no residual vegetation on the paddock, mice lived on the margins, invaded paddocks from the margins when times were favorable. Now, with retained stubbles, mice live in the paddocks all year round. They build burrow networks. One of the guys today was talking about the role of pasture as refuge for, for mice. Uh, while they're not seeing a lot of mice in their stubbles or in their, in their cropping paddocks at the moment, they are seeing mice as a, as a, um, a refuge um, population in, stubble, in, sorry, in pastures that will then be there to invade uh, crops when times are good. Um, and of course, in dual cropping systems where we've got a summer crop as well, there's food in the system all year round, and that's going to be sustaining mouse populations. Um, up north, that's more significant because the weather's warmer more often, and so the mice will be active basically the whole year round. Um, at least the winter time down here slows them down. Um, or I'd like to go on and talk a little bit about rate, bait research if we've got, if we've got a bit of time. Um, so back in 2017 or 18, we were getting lots of reports from farmers and saying, you know, sometimes I put out my zinc phosphide, it works really well. Other times I put it out and, and we get smashed. That doesn't seem to make any difference. And one farmer that I was talking to from around Birchip in Western Victoria, he was, in, he was so frustrated by it that he basically couldn't stand still. He was pacing backwards and forwards saying, Steve, I've put out three, four applications of zinc phosphide and they're still smashing me. So what that made us think about was um, if, if a mouse is in a barley stubble successfully eating barley, why would it transition to a, to a new or novel food type at, at, with zinc phosphide on it? So we thought, well, all right, well, how can we make the bait substrate more attractive? So we went looking for, for a different, more attractive bait substrate. We did some work in the lab and we ended up trialing our malted barley, um, durum wheat. We, you know, we were looking for high value food. We looked at lentils. The, the bait substrate in this story becomes a little bit irrelevant when you hear that we trialed different bait substrates with zinc phosphide on. We had individual mice in cages with no, nothing on the floor of the cage, just two food trays, one with a background food, one with the alternative bait substrate with zinc phosphide on it. So we knew exactly how many grains of zinc phosphide they were eating. When we did this, 
most of the mice in the study took at least what we considered to be a lethal dose and we only killed half the number of mice that we thought we, would, we should have killed. So that made us ask questions about whether we had been selecting for tolerant mice over the years that we'd been baiting with zinc phosphide, which has been about 15 or 20 years now. Um, and so we went back to first principles and redid the studies to determine just how sensitive mice were to zinc phosphide. And you can see in that photo there, essentially what we do is we put a known dose of zinc phosphide directly into the stomach of the mouse uh, in, in a similar way to, to the way you drench a cow or a sheep. But the difference is that, that that syringe actually goes all the way down into the stomach. So we're putting a known dose directly into the stomach. So there's no, no questioning about what they ate or what they didn't eat. Uh, we used mice from areas where we had been spreading zinc phosphide for a lot of years. Um, mice, wild mice that had never been exposed to zinc phosphide and lab mice. And the story that came out of the study was that there was no difference between any of the groups. So we hadn't been selecting for tolerant mice, but we had, but the sensitivity of mice was way lower than we expected. So um, our results differed from the original study and showed that mice were about half as sensitive to zinc phosphide as we expected that they would be. And so if, instead of putting out zinc phosphide bait with 25 grams of zinc phosphide on it per kilo, we actually needed twice that amount, so 50 grams per kilo. The other message that came out of that study was if mice took a sublethal dose of zinc phosphide, they stopped eating it straight away. One of my colleagues calls it the dodgy curry effect. And the way to think about it is if you, if you go to a restaurant and you have a meal that makes you feel crook afterwards, you're not going back to that restaurant anytime soon. And that's the way mice work with zinc phosphide. So we then went on to test this in a, food, in a field setting. Um, <coughs> and we, we had <coughs> nine sites just near parks. Uh, we had three sites where we simply trapped the mice um, to establish a population. We had three sites, or sorry, we had nine sites where we established the population of mice. Uh, three of those sites, we did nothing. Three of those sites, we applied the 25 gram zinc phosphide. Three of those sites, we applied the 50 gram zinc phosphide. Um, we then went back a week later and um, uh, retrapped those populations to see what effect we'd had. Um, the key messages that came out of that was when you use the 25 gram zinc phosphide, you get a medium and variable chance of killing a high proportion of the population. So sometimes you'll kill the whole lot, you'll get a great result. But other times, and, and there's a, a basically an even chance of getting a, an ineffective result. So not killing the numbers that you expected. In comparison with the 50 gram dose, uh, you've got a very high chance of killing a high proportion of the population. Basically greater than 75% of the time, you're gonna kill between 80 and 90% of the mice. Um, but that's some work that's in, uh, or about to publish over the next you know, two or three weeks. We'll hope we have those pa papers in the scientific uh, literature. Um, so the, I think there's some really important messages there. Uh, the other thing was in terms of the durability of the bait in wet conditions, because it basically rains every week at parks at the moment. Um, I went to parks on a Thursday afternoon to, to spread bait on the Friday. It had rained heaps on the Thursday. I decided not to spread on the Friday. I spread it on the Saturday morning after they'd had an inch of rain on the, on the Thursday. Uh, beautiful clear conditions you can see from the photo. Um, we had a dry Saturday night, dry Sunday night, dry uh, Monday night. Tuesday, they had another 24 millimetres of rain. Um, we were still getting dead mice in traps the following Sunday. So that indicated to us that, that the bait is relatively robust under those sort of conditions. Um, if I had the chance, I would spread bait in dry conditions, but in that scenario with three or four dry nights post baiting, we got a really good result. Um, so in summary, um, 
monitoring your, your developing crops is really important to know what's going on. Be prepared to bait before there's alternative food available in the system. Continue to monitor to ensure you've done a good job. Harvest clean, head has put a heap of food into the system. When I talk to farmers, um, a very low proportion of farmers measure what comes out the back of the header. If you're, if you're only getting 150 kilos per hectare, and we've measured that in paddocks after the headers have been through, that's 50,000 mouse days for food. So be really vigilant about monitoring the way your machines are set up. If you've got a contractor harvesting your crop, you tell him to slow, slow down, especially in a season like this, it's much better to put the whole harvest in the bin than feed a heap of mice that are going to cause problems for you the following autumn. Um, and apart from that baiting work that we've described, there's a whole lot of other investments that GRDC are making to minimise the impact that, that mice have on crops. Um, and then, of course, there's a, a, a range of acknowledgements in terms of uh, we have a, a mouse management group that um, meet three times a year to give us an update on mice and we put out warnings about what might be happening with mice based on our data that we've been collecting, <coughs> excuse me, um, and the information that the mouse management group bring to us. Um, we've got an international scientific advisory panel that, that makes sure we're doing good, robust science. Um, there's the road management team at CSIRO that have <coughs> just recently gone to eight people. And there's a whole range of other collaborators, collaborators that work with us. And the key and really important people in all of this are the farmers that allow us to do this work. Um, so at that point, I'm happy to stop and take questions. Steve, we've, we've, we've had one come in on the Q&A. Um, live scenario uh, with low to moderate mice activity and just had 20 to 30 mils of rain with temperatures on the rise. Um, we also have a large canopies which aren't drying out till lunchtime. It's probably along those, how effective is the bait going to be with the moisture in those canopies? Um, will it make the bait less effective? And uh, do we wait until it gets warmer conditions to bait or bait now? Uh, look, I would be, look, if, if I had a run of dry days that were coming up, um, I, I would be baiting now if you were seeing no signs of mice. Just, you know, if we wait three or four weeks, we're, we're trebling and quadrupling the population, um, you know, really quick each time we wait. Um, and I think the word that would come out of the bait producers is it's way more robust than we think it is. If I had a forecast of, you know, rain, I would be holding off until after the rain. But we got, and I know it's a different scenario because we don't have those canopies and moisture cycling. Um, but if you're I, I still would be happy to think that you would get a good result now. Another question come in uh, from James Murray. Is there any research on whether the progeny of the, the bait averters will be more wary of the bait? Uh, no. Uh, so, so mice are very different to rats. Um, rats are neophobic. And so there's some indication that rats will communicate to other rats about the the, whether food's good or bad. Uh, mice are neophilic. They like to investigate new things. And, and that's one of the reasons why there's such a problem when they get everywhere. Um, but we think that, that there will be no communication on to subsequent, pop, uh, subsequent generations about what's good or bad. Um, they're just trying everything. Oh, that's good. Um, is there any, any more questions from anybody on the floor? type into the Q&A or the, or the chat bar um, or anybody from the panellists, anybody got any questions for Steve while he's here? Okay, I'm seeing that message that just popped up there about um, progressing to the 50 gram bait. Um, I'm, I'm interested to sit in and, and hear about supply of bait and those sorts of things because it's, we're getting lots of questions about supply and delays in, the, in bait delivery. So I'd be interested to hear about that. Yeah, so the question was, are we going to move towards a 50 gram active products? Uh, if you've shown the 20 gram products are, uh, are so uh, variable. Right. Yeah, so that's that was that. I don't know whether everybody could see that question. Um, uh, uh, look, I would, in terms of, because I get lots of questions from farmers that have either um, 
holdings of 25 grand bait from previous outbreaks, or, or they've bought 25 grand bait now before they found out about the 50 grand bait. And, and my attitude to that is I, I wouldn't throw it away, I would spread it, but I would spread it under the um, most favourable conditions possible. So I put it out in a scenario where there was the least amount of other food around under the driest conditions possible to give yourself a chance of getting that good result. It, it worked really well under conventional tillage systems because there was no other food around. So when you spread it, mice were able to find two, three, four grains, and that would give them a chance of getting a lethal dose really quickly. And there's a, another one in the, the Q&A. With the recent government subsidies on zinc phosphide, how would you, how do you think uh, this will impact on on the zinc phosphide baiting this season? Um, so look, I, I guess that that I'm, and I'm hoping that farmers will take advantage of those. The subsidy is on the 50 gram bait, and I know that the government have been talking to bait producers to ensure supply of that. Um, just how much? I mean, I think they put up $150 million worth of subsidies. Uh, some of that went into rebates for, for the cost of the impact already incurred. Uh, but I suspect that that will support a fair bit of bait. I think it's up to, you know, am I right? It's up to $10,000 per farm. I think that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, bait ranges from that, uh, well, Four dollars a kilo in South Australia, uh, up to twenty dollars a kilo spread in Queensland if you're spreading it out of an aeroplane. So there's a fair range of bait, but um, it's going to buy a fair bit of, of toxin. And I'll just say one more. Uh, there's two more actually. Uh, we'll do the impact of cool, wet springs on the on mouse numbers. Uh, look, yeah, you know, we we think conditions are going to be you know, perfect for for mouse breeding. Um, lots of food, lots of shelter. Um, yeah, that's that's the reason we're running the flag up. I mean, we can't guarantee a mouse outbreak, but given that we're getting reports from right through the cropping zone, um, yeah, I think we, we should be vigilant and be prepared to do something about it. And a you know, mild, moist spring that leads into a mild, moist summer, um, perfect conditions for mice. That's good. And... Uh... So I'll back onto the, the, the rates of bait. Uh, would you double the rate of a 20 gram uh, uh, strength to two kilos a hectare to get round you uh, if the you know if the high, if the higher load wasn't available? Okay, so the the label rate is is a kilogram per hectare. There is an emergency permit out, and I, I'm, I think that runs till October to allow the spread of up to five kilos per hectare. My concern is that as soon as you double the rate, you double the cost. Um, if you're putting if you're putting it out under conditions when there's where there's not very much other food in the system, if a kilo a hectare is twenty two thousand doses, um, all right. Albeit we know that they need to get more than than one dose now. Um, look, it might increase their chances of finding it. We we haven't done any science to 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 know whether it'll make a difference or not, but I'm concerned that it doubles the price. Oh, yeah. No, well, thank you, thank you, Steve.